You are listening to Level Up Your Gaming Podcast, episode 86, Social Situations Expanded. Today we talk about social situations to explain how to use roles and roleplay in a social game. We demonstrate how to explain how merits work in a social situation and give examples of how they should benefit you in a social roleplay. We also demonstrate how roles work in a social situation to help ask questions you may not know the answers to in a roleplay. Dragori Games, a company that develops RPGs and board games, has reached out to us to bring to your attention their Kickstarter project, Tanaris, that ends on funding on September 30th. Tanaris RPG 5e is a campaign setting and adventure levels 3 to 12. It includes supplemental and unprecedented new options for players. Many legends and idols from the history of RPG are participating in the project, such as Ed Greenwood, Skip Williams, Amy Vorpal, Bruce Naismith, Skyrim's lead designer, and several others. It has raised more than $1.5 million and could soon become one of the most funded 5e projects in the platform's history. Please check out their Kickstarter at kickstarter.com slash projects slash Dragori Games slash Tanaris RPG. The link for the Kickstarter will be in the show notes. If you'd like to participate in the discussion or leave us feedback, you can contact us at levelupyourgamingpodcast at gmail.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash levelupyourgaming. If you like the content and want to hear more of the show, subscribe and we'll ensure you don't miss an episode. New episodes come out almost every Wednesday. Also, please review, tell a friend about the podcast, or share with your gaming group. Now sit back and enjoy the episode. Welcome into the Level Up Your Gaming Podcast. My name is Aaron, and joining me in person, he is the master of social situations, Jared. I am incredibly socially awkward, though. Uh, I mean, I guess in the sense of like the real world i guess there are times everybody's got their moments everyone's got their moments i'm, I'm average i'm just an average joe you're an average joe I'm an average joe how you been doing jared uh, not bad not bad not traveling as much so that's kind of nice or when i travel it's like monday to monday to thursday rather than that is a lot better than what like sunday, sunday to friday. friday yeah yeah so at, le- at least you've got a moment to be at home at least I'm home for like three days instead of you know one and a half. Yeah, yeah, that 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 that's a big, a big improvement. Literally, there was a time that I was home for like forty eight hours. Like that's it, and then I'd be flying again. Yeah, it t- it takes a toll on your uh, just. I mean, like I, on my I, marriage, on your marriage, on your on your life in general. I mean, I always felt bad coming over and doing game. Like it's one of the things that we really like doing. But it's like, honestly, Ellie and I got. Game was part of, of, we got, we actually got into a fight. I mean, we're a husband and wife. We're going to do that. Mm-hmm. Allie and I have a good fight about once a year, like a good solid, like scream at each other mm-hmm. fight about once a year. Um, and, um, this was not one of those. Um, it was not a, like a, bah, 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 bah. um, it was more of like a Jared, I need to be honest with you. Like you're traveling too much and yada yada and when you are home you have game on on saturday night when you know i only get to see you for 48 hours and you know at, at that point I, I very much considered like telling you guys like hey i got i got to tone back in you know and it, it you know work fortunately changed you know i started flying out on on mondays rather than on sundays mm-hmm. so i got to see my wife for the whole day on sunday so she kind of got Sundays. Um, but, I mean, if, if work picks back up again to that level where I need to do that again, I might have to tell you guys, like, hey, it's going to be every other week. It's not going to be every week. Mm, you yeah. know. End of an era. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to get a new job, so <laughs> <laughs> hopefully we won't come to that point. Uh, I, I hope not, but we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. So Hopefully sliding into a different position where no travel is required. <laughs> Hopefully soon. Um, but yeah. Um, so I, I think we teased this in the last episode uh, was Chris had sent us an email about our social game episode. And the whole point of it, uh, the, or the whole point of his email was, or the, the part that I took away from it, specifically was that he asked about like specific examples for the social game aspect. And so I was thinking, well, you know, what'd be fun is to, to, to put those examples into kind of like a concrete situation here. 
and to talk about, um, you know, how I, how I would approach it if I was a player and how you might approach it if you were a GM and how, if you were going to incorporate social role play um, to let the character's merits as a social character shine through or how you would do it if you were going to incorporate roles or if you're going to go straight roles, something like that. So, so it just kind of gives some different examples and gives some kind of tips that kind of go on there because I feel like this is one of the areas that we do really well, okay? Yeah. I, I think that, like, it is abundantly clear. I've played in the, the Thursday night game that I played in. I've played in some other uh, kind of smaller games and stuff too. The social side of our gaming is very very well defined mm -hmm. and a lot of player people in, in tables don't have that it's it's a it's a it's an afterthought or something that you know I think it is that is that's probably the best way to put it for a lot of tables it is an afterthought it's combat first combat first then mental you know then then you got to have your puzzles and shit like that and then people are like oh yeah but ironically in, a, in the real world that we work in social you know, is 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 the key thing for ninety nine percent of this world. I mean, not a lot of your game between the combat is gathering the information. How do you get the players to go from point A to point B, and how do you make that feel organic? And that is all in the social interaction that you end yeah. up doing. Um, I mean, there's some some mental interaction stuff that you can do if you're investigating things or if you're trying to to you know puzzle something out. But I think most of it comes down to. This is a social interaction. This is, I'm going to go gather information and then I'm going to act upon that information and go gather more information or, uh, you know, go sneak into the, the, the tomb of the unknown. And, and, I mean, like, honestly, unless you're running a game where it's, it's one player, because if you have two players, there might be a social situation between them. If you run, unless you're running a game where it's literally one player and everything is document based. Like, you go to the Tower of, of Green, and it tells you go to the Tower of Yellow. Like, there's a letter there. It says go to the Tower of Yellow. When it's one player, it's really easy because you can adapt to that person a, a ton. But once you get two players, more cooks in the kitchen, you're going to have more people thinking about different things to do. Yep. And different people who want to play different things. And the, the goal here in the Level Up Your Gaming podcast is to encourage that social play. Yes. I think, um, and again, this is an area that I think anybody can level up their gaming in oh okay. so um the idea here and the, what we're going to try to do over the podcast and well maybe there might be some skillful edits in here <laughs> but uh we're going to play a little situation or we're going to play some situations where jared is a barkeep okay or a tavern keeper or you know we'll, we'll, we'll uh, appropriately okay, aaron you gotta give me more than that you gotta, what, what air am i in what's my motivation <laughs> um you're I'm joking <laughs> so and then I'm going to be the player searching for information and I'm going to be searching for information on who killed the king. Okay. Okay. So we are in a monarchical state. So unless we're in a very, very actually let, let, let's, let's, let's play this out. Okay. I'm investigating the tavern and the tavern was uh, attacked last night or robbed. Okay. So I'm trying to get information about it. Okay, okay. I was okay. robbed last night. You were robbed last night. <sighs> I'm, I'm salty. Am I a male? Am I a female? I'll let you decide. Okay, I'll be a male. Young or old? I'll let you decide. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but the idea here is that uh, what I want Jared to understand is that my character that, I, that I'm playing here has a way with words. I've got a merit or some sort of uh, benefit that says I've got a way with words. So I'm going to push back a little bit, you know, so you can highlight some of those. So, yeah. So the the, the, the purpose to this is, is that if I'm going to come in a, in a full role play, okay, and talk to Jared, my hope would be that as the GM, he, would, he knows I've got a way with words. Yep. Okay. Otherwise, I can highlight it in the conversation to see maybe I can skillfully navigate him into into the correct situation here. So I'm going to come on in. Howdy, good sir. That's me sweeping. Oh, okay. <laughs> how, how are you doing? Did you drink? Um, I'm actually here on behalf of the uh, the city guard. Uh, I understand that you were head of City guard. Useless. 
Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, but uh, I, I understand that we've got that you had a robbery last night. I was wondering maybe if you could tell me anything about that. Well, what's there to say? I mean, they they came in and and uh, they busted in the door. There were four of them. So you were here. You witnessed them. Can you tell me anything about the people that you saw? Well, um, they were, uh, you know, uh, uh, tall. Um, you know, uh, dressed in black. So I'm going to pause this there for a second. What am I doing right now? Okay. Notice that this person is giving information willy nilly. Um, why? Because Aaron has the merit way with words. Aaron is talking to me, right? So he's, he's actually deciding not to go straight to roles. He is the player has not initiated any roles, and I don't feel that as if he has given me pause to where I'm demanding a role, right? He's asking innocuous questions. He's got uh, backing behind him, so he's suggesting that he's part of the city guard or is working for the city guard. So I'm going to be a little bit more amenable because this person might get me some back of my money. So um, automatically in my head, I'm thinking... I should kind of be nice to this guy because maybe I'll get some of my stolen cash back. But then he's got the way of words. So I'm I'm going to actually just be amenable to him in this situation. I'm not going to clam up because he's got that way with words, you know. Even though Aaron might not have a way with words, his character does. So what that bartender is hearing is saying, I should give you more information. Okay, and scene. Um, I, um. So there were four of them. So they're tall. They were dressed in black. Yeah. They had uh, those pointy fisherman hats. Can you describe the situation? Were, were you cleaning up for the night? Were you, what was happening? Yeah, we were, we were, I was, you know, counting the till. And, um, you know, same time every night. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm counting the till and there are maybe two or three people left in the bar. Chef's already left for the night. He'd already cleaned up, you know, but... Are these regulars that come into the bar? Yeah. Yeah, there was... Um, Can I Todd, get their names, please? Todd and Neil and... and Varkas, the... Uh, the, the uh, Varkas, the, uh, the the rogue. All right, so I'm going to pause this here, and um, I'm going to come back into this scene again from the perspective of somebody who maybe... I. I we, we, we've role played out the situation several times before in terms of like, this is kind of how I would approach a, a, an investigation or an interrogation into somebody. Yes, absolutely. Um, which is, you know, I'm going to come in, I'm going to ask leading questions into this, but now you might be listening to this and going like, well, they're, you know, they, they've, they've thought about how they're going to document this scene. And right now we're just kind of playing around. Well, we're playing around, but if you've also noticed, there are some advantages that I've given to Aaron in the investigation. Small words that were specifically put there because of his character having a way with words. I'm giving him more information than I would if he didn't have a way with words. So, for example, I said, I'm counting the till, the same thing I do every night about the same time. Ah, all right. Now Aaron can say this might be an inside job. It's somebody who knows that he counts the till every night at 9 o'clock. Exactly. So, but one of the other things that we could do here is instead of of approaching it this way, I might come in and I might go. Uh, I'm part of the city guard. Okay, we 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 get through that 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 beginning piece there. Okay, and then I go. I, I start asking him questions like, um, so can you tell me what happened here? I think like every player group um, should be able to ask those those questions. Mm-hmm. And if you have a way with words, you should be able to work your way into that. Now, what might come up here next is you might go. Hmm, interesting. I, he, he's giving me information on this, but I don't quite know what to ask. I want to ask him more about the uh, the bar itself. I don't I don't know how to ask that question or how to vocalize it. And so this might be the part where Jared goes, "Hey, give me a role." Okay. Okay. So Jared, I, you know, I want to ask him about about uh, you know more about his bar and, and you know. Uh, you know, his day to day, I don't have a good way to ask him that. I don't know what to do. You know what? Give me a roll of let's go with charisma plus leadership because you're guiding him 
towards that. Okay, we're using the White Wolf system here. Also, Obviously. I want to note that um, it would be gather information. I think from D and D from, from Star Wars. I think it's gather information. Um, you'd probably do like a persuasion check or an intuition check. It depends on what you want the player to get out of it. Gotcha. So the player maybe might say, "I want to ask him a question." So roll me a persuasion check. Okay, and you know, you would set the difficulty, and then maybe I'm like, I'm like, huh, is he hiding any information? Is he not telling me something? Like that would be where I would bring in the intuition check. Right. And, and, and if someone goes, is he hiding something or is he telling the truth? Now, mind you, those are two different situations. Um, people who hold something back versus people who are absolutely lying. There's two different, two different roles I make for that, you know? And, and that's one thing. So if Aaron goes, I want to check if, I'm, if he's hiding something or if he's lying, I'm going to get clarification. Are you checking to see if he's hiding something or are you checking to see if he's lying? So Aaron would, you know, at that point, Aaron goes. So, hey, are you, I, I want to know if he's, uh, I want to try to detect a lie right now. Okay, go ahead and roll me your uh, charisma plus subterfuge or manipulation plus subterfuge. Okay, go ahead and roll. Jared succeeds. All right, he succeeds. The bartender isn't lying. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so anyways, I, I, I'm going to continue on with the, this, this line of interrogation, but I, you asked me to give you a role of charisma plus leadership. So I get the charisma plus leadership role to ask him the right question, um, to get to carry it forth the conversation and find out more information about kind of his day to day, his patrons and his staff. Okay. So I, I roll my charisma plus leadership. I succeed. You succeed. Yes. Are you sure about that? I do. It's not a botch. Not a botch. I don't know. I don't see you rolling any dice. I'm a little sketch. <laughs> I succeed. All right, you succeeded. Okay, so, well, day to day, I mean, we 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 run a pretty tight ship here. Um, you know, we've got the uh, uh, come in around sunrise. Um, you know, when the when the clock tower strikes seven, I come in and uh, make sure the bar's open when the clock tower strikes seven. Um, Typically, we, we make breakfast. The chef comes in same time. Uh, waitresses usually don't come in till, till 7, but me and the chef are here at sunrise. Um, you know, so we, uh, you know, we, 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 we do everything at night, so it's pretty easy in the morning. We make the eggs, and, you know, people come in. Typically, around 8 o'clock is when people start coming in for their breakfasts, and we serve them all. Um, then things are pretty quiet until about lunchtime, Um you know, usually just make sure all the dishes are done between breakfast and lunch and chef served lunch. And, you know, few, few people bars, pretty quiet at lunch. Most people don't, don't drink during lunch. Um, then, uh, you know, between lunch and dinner is pretty quiet. Uh, you know, not many people be here except for Jebediah, the drunk, you know, he's always here. Um, you know, just every day, all day, but, does kind he of converse makes me with w- anybody? Jeb Dye the drunk? Yeah. I mean, converses with everybody. I mean, he'll talk to anybody who's in the bar at any time. So uh, so the, the, the next thing I'm going to ask here is I'm going to ask, um, what, you know, do you have any regulars that have been, that new regulars that have been showing up to the bar? Uh, people that maybe... Uh, you, you haven't seen before, but they, they started to frequent the bar more, more likely. I'm going to start kind of pointing down a path of people who I might think have done this robbery. Okay. You know what? Give me a roll of uh, charisma plus leadership again. Okay. I succeed. It's more of a chick. I don't know what kind of dice you're rolling. You're rolling rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I succeed. Okay, you succeed. You know what? Um, I think Jebediah was talking to this one guy. He threatened him. He was new. Like, I, I didn't see him very much very often. And, like, Jebediah, he, he tries having conversations with everybody, you know. So there was this guy who came in maybe four or five days in a row. He almost stabbed Jebediah. And... uh you know, I, I I told him to, you know, we just pushed him out and let him cool off because every, every penny counts. You know, so, um, you know, uh, other than that, we got that group of adventurers came in uh, a few weeks ago. 
one of their rogues keeps coming in here every night. I don't know if you ever met him. Uh, no, I have not. Uh, how many people are a part of that adventuring group? Like eight. Um, uh, okay. They come in here usually for dinner. And, uh, how, how, how is the, uh, the staff? How has the staff been? Has the staff been, uh, uh, any complaints recently? Anybody who might want to do this to you? Anybody who might want to do My staff? Home? No, I love them all. They're all like family. Um, who do you have working here? So this is part where I would gather information to, to talk about who he's got working at, at the bar. So this is going to, every, every piece here that I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, to, to suss out more information to be able to corroborate his story with additional people or not. Now w- notice what I've, I've also given him. Um, some things that I don't give him roles for. I'm giving him information. Now when he asked about new people, I gave him two groups of suspects. Right, it could be this group of adventurers because the rogue keeps coming in. It could be this guy who was here for four nights in a row and almost stabbed the drunk because he kept talking to him. Um, and when, when when he actually tells me that no, the staff is is perfectly fine, uh, no complaints, I'm going to say I want to detect a lie. I'd say go ahead and roll me a manipulation plus subterfuge. Okay, I go. There you go. There you go. That's good. Okay, I succeed in the role against manipulation plus subterfuge. He is lying. Um, you just kind of detect that he's not being completely truthful about the staff all being family. Okay, so th- this is the part where, and I'll, I'll tell everybody who's listening to the episode, this is the part that becomes the hardest part to role play. Because nobody knows how to break into, why well, just lie to me? Okay, <laughs> that's... That's the question you want to ask, but you don't know how to ask it tactfully. It, it's where the the risk actually comes in because right now we're just having a polite conversation. Now I'm just going to say something that might upset him and shut down the conversation. Okay, so in our investigation rules, we have multiple different techniques to gain the trust of the fellow individual. One okay. that I tried recently that just did not work. Yeah, no, it didn't work at all. No. Uh, so interrogation. I can go with a peaceful interrogation which I would do by trying to fraternize with the person and try yep. to gain a rapport, which I'm sort of doing now through the role play. Um, but I might say, Jared, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to try to to fraternize with this person. Well, let's open up the four. So there's fraternization, good cop, bad cop, hostile, and then torture. Um, because let's admit it, these are all ways of getting of interrogating person. Yes. yes. Uh, unfortunately, there are too many groups out there that just go straight to torture. <laughs> it's uh boy you took us back in time it's the probably the, 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 oh yeah we would always, always go 100 <laughs> um but the 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 good cop bad cop routine obviously i'm playing here by myself with jared in this um that works sometimes but typically you know if you want to try with the lighter side of things you're going to obviously start with with fraternization and then you're going to work your way up into more hostile uh Things and so good cop bad cop is you know one person's doing the the fraternize. Well, it's not it's not good cop bad cop. It, it it's more trapping them in the words. It's more locking them into what their previous statements were. Yeah, let me let me actually pull this up real quick. Whoa, whoa, Aaron's going online during the yeah going going online during the pod. I should have had it pulled up to begin. You know with. what? Some people do. I've I've heard it on other podcasts. Yeah, uh, that's that's my 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 deepest regret is that I didn't have this pulled up how when we you? started. I know how dare I we'll go into our our house rules here. Help, uh, house and helpful rules. Okay, so there are there are th- four types that we have, which is fraternize. Uh, I think it's just five: fraternize, peaceful interrogation, hostile interrogation, physical threat, and then torture. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the obvi- the way that, that, that fraternizes the character is trying to gain trust and friendship, okay? Yep. And build a rapport. Build a rapport. Peaceful interrogation is plus hostile interrogation would be your good cop, bad cop. Yeah. That would be somebody's being empathetic and some guys being totally intimidating. And so I'm going to funnel my We know you did it. So, so, but you could do it both ways. You could try to, it's, uh, you know, using classic interrogation methods to build a rapport with 
is, is what we call peaceful interrogation. And then uh, you say hostile interrogation is characters classic bad cop techniques. Uh, you know, threatening consequences, claiming the truth is already known, that sort of stuff. Uh, and then physical threat is when the uh, the player starts to uh, threaten harm against the subject. Um, this can go as far as like grabbing them, pushing them, like nothing slapping them, nothing where you're actually physically like beating not the breaking crap out fingers. Of them. You're you know it's it's uh, it's I shove them against the wall. Exactly, I know? grab them. I shove them against the wall. Tell me what you. It's the Batman version. Yes, and then where torture, are the drugs? Torture is obviously torture. Torture's okay. like, I'm going to continue bending your arm until you tell me the truth. And then Jared then has, has a series of different pieces of information here, which is public, confidential, harmful, catastrophic, and lethal. And so that's where, that that's the person's, the difficulty level that I set based on the, um, the person's uh, belief of what giving out this information. So if I think there is no consequence, right, it's public knowledge. Like if I said... You know, uh, so I'm, if, if, I, if, I'm if, a I, if I ask the barkeep about his day to day, it's public, public information. Knowledge. He's not going to he's not going to get get upset about it. If I ask the barkeep about um, how much money he makes, that'd be confidential. Confidential. I'm, I'm that's none of your business. None of your business. However, it might be prudent to the investigation, which might is be. why it's because he's like about. making good money. That's why they targeted him for the. OK, if I ask the barkeep, does he. Uh, Harmful information would be... Are you sleeping with one of the married yeah, waitresses? You, yes. It's okay. like it's going to damage my reputation. It's going to damage her reputation. Catastrophic information would be... Um, her husband is six foot five and a sword-swinging mercenary. I might get beat the fuck up from that. But if I ask him, like, are you harboring criminals? That could be catastrophic information. I could go to jail for it. I uh, maybe even asking now asking how much money his bar makes for him might be catastrophic if he's laundering money for the local bad guy guild. Exactly. So I mean like these things vary based upon the perception of of the of the, the individual. Of the individual. And then obviously lethal information is probably going to lead to someone's death. And so but how much money you make could lead to his death. Like I've just now basically tied myself to or, or expose the, the local syndicate. Yeah, like let's say the local syndicate, you know, is utilizing his his as a front to, to wash their money. Um, if the local syndicate's like, oh, well, you know, anyone who crosses us, we beat them up. I don't know, Team Rocket, right? <laughs> we beat the shit out of them with our Pokemon, you know, compared to, you know, the Italian mafia where they're probably going to, you know, they're going to whack me. You know, it, it's all depending on the threat level that this person perceives. So, like, for example, the bartender with, with the wife, right? So he's sleeping around with one of the uh, uh, waitresses. At To give another level of example, uh, you know, confidential is, eh, like, I shouldn't be sleeping with my employees, right? Like, that's just bad form. Now, the next level was... Uh, harmful. Harmful, which is... Okay, she's married. Like, uh oh, that's a big thing. Then it goes to catastrophic, where she's married to a six foot fall, four sword swinging, ad, you know, adventurer, who's probably going to beat the ever living piss out of me. You know, probably going to hurt me real bad when he finds out I'm sleeping with his wife. And lethal is he's known for a bad temper and murks people on a daily basis. I'm sleeping with the mob boss's wife. You know, yes, and, and also remember that things that might seem mundane to can you. end up in the le- to to you as the as the player could end up in the lethal category for somebody else because the the harm. This is all subjective to that individual. The the harm factor is one of these things where it's like Jared gave the example in in the previous episode when we talked about the social situation that if perhaps like you like the embarrassment of telling something might be so bad that it's actually a lethal situation not because you would die from it but because like you just couldn't stand the shame of somebody knowing that secret from you yeah um you know let's say the person is so let's say this bartender for example is you know a a a deacon in the church right and that he is sleeping around with somebody is catastrophic to him 
You know, I'm sleeping with a married woman. This is going to destroy my social life. This is, you know, I'm going to get kicked out of my church. This is catastrophic. It's not lethal, but it's catastrophic. You know, so it's it's all in the eye of the beholder. Because it's in the eye of the beholder of what that information does. Because, again, like if you, let's say you sleep with a teddy bear, okay, and that's something that is dreadfully terrible to you in terms of like, I cannot let anybody know this because it's, it, it's bad. If somebody knows this, like somebody would look down upon me for, for this. Nothing wrong with sleeping with teddy bear. I'm just, I'm throwing it out there as, as an example here. It's true. To somebody that could feel like catastrophic information, meaning that if they release that, they would feel like they're, because it's how they would feel. Feel, exactly. If it, if it got released, it would be that that information would destroy their life. Now, tip for storytellers, when dealing with children, okay, if you have a child NPC, mind you, whatever you do, they tend to, because they are not as tempered as adults, uh, they tend to take things to the extreme. So what we would see is like, eh, that it'd be harmful to my reputation. Think of a kid who's like, it got out on social media and parents are like, okay, it got out on social media that you sleep with a teddy bear. Yeah, if you think about if you think about the things that you have actually experienced in your life, the ones that feel the worst were probably mundane shit that happened. Pretty in innocuous. Yeah. Okay, and that that's where we are. But back then, oh my god, the world was ending. Yes. So when I come back into this scene that we have here, where Jared is playing our barkeep, and I am uh, fraternizing, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go the route of saying, you know what, this has gone gone well uh i already feel like i've fraternized with them so i'm gonna go into peaceful interrogation um and i, I want to ask him why he's lying or, or 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 is he is he holding something back to protect someone now notice aaron says he's like i want to know um i can detect as his storyteller that he's not quite sure how to word it because he just gave me like three different examples of how he might word it so as a storyteller as a good storyteller i should be trying to feel out what my player is trying to do and whether or not they feel comfortable handling that on their own. You know, I'm going to word it, but noticing that Aaron just gave me three different ways that he might approach it. I'm going to call for a roll. So Aaron, go ahead. And uh, what is the role for that? I don't know. Uh, this one we have as manipulation plus empathy versus the target's willpower. Um, again, if you're playing in uh, D and D uh, persuasion is probably the direction you're going to go here. However, you might not roll persuasion. You might you might roll it persuasion, but you might put the modifier with a different attribute. But I'm going to give this as confidential because he likes the idea that everyone thinks that it's a it's a he's got a great staff and they're a family. Got it. Okay, so I'm going to roll. Um, I'm actually going to fail this roll. I'm going to 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 fail it in the in the sense of. Well, actually, for the role play here, I, I might as well... No, let's fail. Okay, let's fail, because I'm going to remember all the success that Aaron has built. That is something that that it makes social so much more uh, ingrained as a... Not ingrained. Difficult as a, as a thing to do rather than combat. Because combat, I don't have to remember what you did except for the points of damage that you did to him. I don't have to remember that. Well, you got to remember, okay, he's got a broken leg. This, I have to remember that Aaron has built a rapport over the last, how many minutes we had? <laughs> uh, this is 30 minutes, but, you know, probably 10 minutes of conversation. 10 minutes of conversation, Aaron has built a good rapport. I'm not going to destroy that with a single failure. He has built a 10-minute rapport with this guy. So Aaron went ahead, he made his roll, he failed. This is my response. Are you ready? And scene. No, I, I'm not lying. I, I know there are other bars out there that... You know, they try to give the family feel, but we really are a family here. Notice all I had this person do. So stop. What I had this person do is he reiterates the lie. That was his failure. His failure was simply that this guy is going to continue to deny that anything is wrong. Okay. And then what I want to point out here is, so this works both ways. Typically in our games, and if you're a player, um, I want you to heed this call. This will level up your playing, not just the the entire game. This will level up your playing in every situation you end up doing. If you fail at something, do not double down and immediately come back and just say, I try it again. Okay? You can. Because you can. There's, there's nothing in the rule books that you say you can't do that. My 
suggestion to players to, to become better players and to work with your GMs in a better situation. Okay. And I always feel this so it's kind of a self-imposed rule. Uh, you don't have to do it is I then like to ask a different question and then work my way back in. So like I am now trying to justify why I would continue down this line of questioning, not just because I failed the role. Okay. Failing the role is, is one thing. So like Jared, there, there's, there's multiple ways that Jared can answer, answer questions to me in a game. Okay. Jared can answer with affirmatives, meaning you have succeeded in something or you did do the task or, you know, he is lying or, um, you have gathered all the information possible. Okay. Or, you know, there are no traps behind that door. Yeah. Okay. Jared also, when I succeed, could answer in a non-affirmative way, meaning you don't think there are any traps behind that door. <laughs> don't do that. Okay. You don't think <laughs> it's so rude. You don't detect any. It's, you don't detect any. You don't lies. detect any booby traps. Okay. <laughs> oh, you shit. don't. You don't. You don't have you. The, it. You aren't giving affirmation to their success. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is that. If you're a player and you're trying to affirm success by continuing to roll till you succeed, your GM has every right then to make it ambiguous to you. Yes. Okay? Because you are trying to break the system in that I am going to get the best possible outcome. Yep. But if you end up doing it in a way where you where you try to work with your GM and go like, oh, I failed that role, let me justify why I would come back and ask the same question again. So, like, I might then ask Jared the question, like, like okay, well, I, I, I totally understand that. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I, I've, you know, if, if I talk to your other employees, am I going to get the same story? Okay, and then I might ask to roll the, the, the you know, the, 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 basically the interrogation roll there again to see if he'll, he'll now break and kind of move forward. Notice that he asked, he pivoted in a different light. You know, if I ask if I ask everyone else, are they going to respond? Well, there's my wife. <laughs> forgot to turn my phone on silent. Yeah, I forgot to put his phone on silent. Uh, uh, hold on, let me let me put that on silent. So, um, yeah, I I might uh, want Aaron to do that, and if he does it too prematurely, I'm well within my rights to be like, he's going to be like, oh, of course, of course, if you ask all my other staff, you know. Or I might or, ask him some other questions about his staff. I might start pointing and digging into it now and trying to ask more details. Okay, so who do you have working here? And I'll be like, how long have they worked here? And, you know, it, if he gives me somebody who's been working there for six months, okay, I might be like, so you think they're family too? Like, or do you, like, yeah, I might, I might, I might. After re- half a year, you might grow that level of trust. I'm just saying. I might, I might reapproach the subject on individuals okay yep. instead of a broad base situation or i might reapproach the subject um you know on the, the, the to to really kind of like hammer in on somebody who i think is probably the problem there or to get him to give me more information on each individual so like i haven't failed outright but i failed in that role meaning that like i'm not just coming back and being like i ask him again why he's lying i go back into peaceful interrogation I'm just going to fold my arms and do that. I'm just saying, just don't do that. As I, I, my suggestion is, I'm not going to say don't do it because it's it, within your rights as a player. Yeah. But my suggestion would be to not do that. Okay. But it's within my rights as your storyteller to fuck with you on that. Yes. And if you want your storyteller to be more kind to you, showing him that you are not just doubling down into success, you'll find this with everything. Like, again, if you're searching for traps and your storyteller is trying to be like, <laughs> like, you don't think anything's wrong. Like, okay, like, listen, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a level 20 rogue, okay? I've been doing this shit since you were in diapers. Okay? <laughs> like, you know, that's the type of thing that, 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 that drives you nuts. It, it, it can be really fun if you start the entire tone of a game in that situation to make it very tense, mm-hmm. I guess, like you did in Red Lake. But... um. Oh, I Look, thought that was very clever. Looking back on it now, such a jerk move. It was, it worked out because we were totally invested in the game. Oh yeah, but it, out, but a game later, and when it got 
thrown on me. I was like, holy shit, that fucking sucks. Yeah, all, all, all it takes is putting it back on your GM, which is another reason why you should try to GM if you're a player. Um, <laughs> just do the same thing your GM's done to you and see how they like it. And then they'll go like, hmm, okay. Mm, maybe I, I should it. change my ways. I get it now. Um, we're, we're actually going to go ahead and stop the, the role play here because I think we've given some, some decent mm-hmm. examples for it. But um, the only one that we haven't given was like a botch or a critical failure. And again, it depends on whether or not you're playing critical failures in a game. Right. Um, my suggestion would be if you run a critical failure, uh, and this is something maybe you probably want to establish in, in a session zero, is that if you run a critical failure, you just can't do that action again until the scene is over. That's, okay? a, that's a great one. Um, you know, a lot of people, they, they look at critical failures in social situations, they immediately go, this has now become hostile. No, the critical failure means that they have terminated it and they're terminating it for a small duration of time. And the other big thing that you need to take away from social situations that I just thought of and remembered this is, is that unless you bury the lead, meaning like you go to torture, okay? Unless unless you, you bury that, which is why you should always start with fraternization, peaceful interrogations at the top, if you don't bury your reputation with the person, then you always have a chance to come back yeah, it's and compete combat. again. It's not okay. Fine. You can you can come back and compete again and again and again. Yep. Okay. And that that makes a big difference because as my character probably will go from this to talking to the three patrons, his entire staff, the drunk, okay, to get a better picture of what has happened here, okay, which is what your what your players should do. If that is going to happen, then I might say, now that I've gotten more information, I'm going to come back and talk to the guy. And that gives me more opportunity to go into the fraternization side of things. Like, do I want to continue down the line of why do you think everybody's family? Okay. Or do I want to go more into the, the, tell me more about this person specifically. Yeah. I need to know more about them. So it, it helps you put that whole picture together there. Is so if you're a player, don't be don't be afraid of failures in the social situation. No. And if you're a GM, you know, you can be a little bit of a jerk to them if they keep just saying, "Well, I know I failed, so I want to keep going." Yeah. Let's give you a license. Do you have anything else you want to add to this, Jared? No, I'm pretty satisfied. All right. Well, we hope that you enjoyed our uh, our little back and forth kind of <laughs> impromptu role play there to kind of give ideas and, and try to flesh out our examples into it to, to explain how we would go yeah. go forward. We didn't do the straight, um, you just roll for information kind of thing. But if we did, if I had gone that route, I would have expected Jared as the GM to play out that information to me like the yes. character is talking to me to try and engage me to ask I'm not questions. just going to hand him information like, okay, he says this, this, and this. Unless the NPC is relatively unimportant or the information is un- unimportant. So that, that that's the only the only other thing I wanted to point out with that little caveat there. But um, go, go ahead and let us know how you handle social situations. Like, I mean, it's a I would love to hear different examples in different games how you know it's handled from a white wolf perspective. We've hammered down a pretty uh, pretty good niche with it, but in you know D and D, it's it's a pretty foreign concept because there's only a couple skills that really Do pertain that. to it. Yeah. Um, but uh, and let us know if you if you like what we we kind of had there uh, for it as well. Um, so you can contact us at levelupyourgamingpodcast at gmail or at facebook.com slash levelupyourgaming. We are also on YouTube. So smash that like button and then have a good conversation with it. Excellent. Um, and then uh, go ahead and review the podcast on your favorite podcast site. Subscribe if you're not already subscribed to listen to more of this great content. Um, and uh, go ahead and share with your your friends, your family, anybody else who likes gaming. Share with your players because this is one that I think your players could take something away from as well. Like the, I, the, yeah. we, we get a couple of those episodes where I think like, hey, players will probably want to hear how to kind of ask some of these, these pointed questions. Um, anyways, that's going to wrap us up for this week. Uh, so for Jared, I'm Aaron. Have a great week, everybody. Have a great week, everyone.